Hoff Vey, good evening, and thanks for tuning in to the Pacific News Center's News. Now, I'm Clint Rogel. And I'm Janella Carrera. Thanks for tuning in. At the top of your news tonight, with a new year ahead, Senator Brent McCready is hoping for a new look at the island's prison system in the hopes of getting a prison reconstruction bill approved. PNC went on a media tour today at Department of Corrections, along with other senators and stakeholders. Here's a first-hand look behind bars. Leaking roofs, no air conditioning, untidy bathrooms, and overcrowding. These are just a few of the many issues facing the Department of Corrections today. Senator Brent McCready organized a tour of the prison compound in the hopes of getting his bill to rebuild the facility passed. He believes Guam is not far from sinking into a federal receivership. California was one of the first, was the first state to be federally received in the prison system. That cost them nearly $40 million a year. Today, there are 747 inmates and detainees at DOC. If they reach 800 prisoners, DOC Director Jose Sanagasin warns an emergency may be declared, and that could alarm the federal government. When I first came on board, the population was a steady 560. That was in 2011. 560 steady. It had grown to 700. So how much will it cost to build a new prison on Guam? We've had many various proposals in the past, and these proposals range anywhere between uh, uh, 30 million to a little bit over 500. If you want us to estimate it, maybe anywhere between maybe 60 million or not. And when you and when you contrast that to federal receivership, we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars. Some of the worst facilities at the Manila compound are the domes, intended to be used temporarily. The domes are now being used to house pretrial detainees. Most of these prisoners are considered low risk, so the security is not as sophisticated. But riddled with holes and absolutely no air conditioning, the prisoners often have to live with scorching temperatures all day. As you can see behind me, within this dome alone, there are 47 pre-trial detainees, only one corrections officer. Over at the SHU, or Special Housing Unit, where some of the island's worst criminals are housed, manpower is also severely lacking. Based on the security assessment that was done through the years and the infrastructure, and the infrastructure this facility requires a 45-man uh, security team to be on duty every shift. We're lucky we have 15. No cameras. Nobody no cameras, no cameras. And I'm, I'm going to tell you the truth. If, if, the, if the inmates wanted to take control of this prison, they can. We, we, we don't have the manpower to, to quell a, a, an uprising of, of that. Of in fact, Harford says there are about 20 prisoners who are serving time off island because DOC doesn't have the facility to be able to control these inmates. It's costing the government of Guam about $60,000 a month to keep them there. A new Guam DOC says Senator McCready would address that issue. Jury selection begins in the rape trial of Francis Drew Taitano, who was a teacher with the Department of Education. Taitano is accused of raping an 11-year-old girl back in 2007, but the complaint wasn't filed until January of 2014, while Taitano was working as a teacher at George Washington High School. According to a magistrate's complaint, Titano was drunk when he sexually assaulted the minor inside his home in Jigo. The complaint says Titano's wife was lying down on the same bed as the rape occurred. Opening statements will begin as soon as jury selection is completed. DOE hopes to achieve financial independence in 2015 by asking the U.S. Department of Education to reconsider the need for a third-party agent to handle federal grants. But what will it take to get to that point? Well, PNC's Betsy Brown reports. After being considered a high-risk grantee by the U.S. Department of Education for a decade now, Guam DOE Superintendent John Fernandez says the road to getting off high-risk is unmapped territory. But it's a road he plans to travel in the coming year. What we're trying to do is uh, we're, you know, really create our own roadmap and put ourselves in a position that we can best assess uh, um, uh, or, or can do the best job in, in convincing the Department of Education um, on the federal side that we're ready to um, remove the high-risk designation uh, and the third-party uh, fiduciary responsibility. That third party costs DOE three to four million dollars a year, but it's been the department's only way of receiving any federal grants since 2009. There are several steps to getting off high-risk status, but Fernandez says independence from the third-party agent is the first step, 
and he'd like to see significant progress on that by July. Between now and the summer, what I want to do is really have a very clear and explicit um, process by which our local employees are able to fully implement and operate this part of, the, of our activities and the third party's role is mostly going to be monitoring. Once his employees can demonstrate their ability to follow procedures and manage risks on their own, Fernandez says they'll be ready to ask USDOE to reevaluate the third party requirement, but they're expecting a thorough review. I think it'll include, a, you know, not just one, you know, one guy coming out to take a look at what we're doing, but they've said that it's going to involve their inspector general, their general counsel, their risk management office, and so forth. So it'll be a pretty uh, extensive review mm -hmm. of that function. And uh, but for all, you know, that's why I think it's important that we have to be ready and really confident that we're ready to go. Betsy Brown, PNC News. The Department of Education is not yet sure when a request for proposal for $100 million in school improvements will be reissued, but Superintendent John Fernandez says progress is being made. The Department of Public Works is taking the lead in the RFP, and it issued an initial one last year. That RFP was withdrawn, however, based on questions from the Attorney General. By law, Simon Sanchez High School will be the first to see improvements which are all funded through the recent property revaluations. The Guam Economic Development Authority is also working with DOE and DPW to finance the project, and Fernandez says the three agencies met this morning. I know that over the next couple of weeks we'll be exchanging drafts. Um, I think we already you had a first draft. We have the Attorney General's comments. So I don't think it'll be a whole, you know, a need to start over from scratch. But we do need to make sure that we've, um, we've got all the details addressed so we can put that out as soon as possible. In an effort to speed improvements at Simon Sanchez up, Senator Mike Sinicholas has invited the media on a tour of the campus tomorrow morning. And after two years of evaluation, the University of Guam is looking to revamp its degree program. That includes phasing out five degree programs and reconstructing three degree programs. PNC's Rizal Romana spoke with UOG President Dr. Robert Underwood, who says the outcome will be better as a whole. The University of Guam is going to make big changes as part of their good to great plan. Under the plan, Yoji will phase out the following degree programs in a few years. Japanese Studies, East Asian Studies, Associate's Degree in Nursing, Bachelor of Art in Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences, and a Master's Degree in Art. Underwood says it's about efficiency and competition. The students that are here are both people that we are academically uh, evaluating, but they're also customers. They're also consumers. They have choices. Underwood says the degree programs up for removal are the ones that have had little to no graduates for years. It's very unfortunate, um, but I, I do see I do see UOG uh, uh, um, reviving that once uh, once our program grows, and I do see. Guam headed towards that direction. I think there's a real hunger and thirst for art in general. And, and will also be transforming or consolidating education classes. Underwood says in three years, the students can get a bachelor's degree in a content area and have to take 15 additional credit hours to become a certified teacher in, for instance, special education. They're calling it a BA plus program. The model that we had wasn't working and the model that we had was not really responsive to kind of the students that we're having today. My gosh, you know, do you want to continue training teachers the same way you've done for 50 years? <laughs> you want to try something different. Underwood says this is what he believes UOG will become after making changes. It will be a great university. Tell people this is not the, your, your grandfather's university. Rosal Romanes, PNC News. Rear Admiral Babette Boulevard says she's willing to meet with the CCU and Speaker Judy Wanpat to discuss the Navy's 40% water rate increase. Both Sanchez and Wanpat wrote letters to the Admiral asking for ways to stem the increase. Sanchez says the Navy has also told him that they are willing to spread out the rate increase over time. CCU Chairman Simon Sanchez says he spoke to Captain Shepard of the Navy Civil Engineer Corps and Captain Shepard told him they are willing to spread out the 40% rate increase over time instead of implementing it all at once. 
First off, as he alluded to in his letter, um, in 2007, they did retract a large rate increase and phased it in over a five-year period. And he's saying that that may be possible. They're, they're going to look at that. Sanchez says this is also something that GWA has themselves done. The second thing that's come out of the discussion is a recognition that our costs uh, are increasingly becoming much lower to run a large uh, water system uh, and it's it's lower cost than it is for them to run a very small water system. Sanchez says this is precisely why the systems should be merged and he's hoping that the Navy will continue discussing this possibility in order to lower rates for both Navy and civilian water customers. However, to do this will require amending a federal law that says the Navy can give the Fena water system to GWA, but they must sell it at fair market value. The same law implied that owed compact impact payments could be used to offset the cost of Fena. The transfer should be cost free. Um, and you know we, we don't, we don't want to have to buy the system. So we're going to need that federal law amended. But at the same token, the federal government still has an obligation on compact impact. Now they Speaker Judy Wanpat and Senator Tom Atta will be meeting with the CCU, GWA, and the Navy to discuss the 40% rate increase as well. And now here is Betsy Brown to tell you what's ahead on News Now.